Hey, in this series of videos, I will try to show you how to configure Recover Point for Virtual Machines 4.3. I'm currently using a beta version of the code, so it's not a final uh, software. However, the majority of the steps will probably remain the same toward the GA release as well. So what we see here is an extreme IRA array at the remote site, I already installed and configured up before VMs at the source site, so I'm going to show you how to do it at the DR site, and then literally we just need to repeat those same steps at the source site as well. What you can see here are three volumes that are going to be volumes that I'm going to replicate the data to using RP4 VMs. RP4 VMs target OVA is the volume that's going to hold the OVA, the VMs that RP4 VMs run from and I'm going to attach it to two ES6 servers. Each ES6 server will actually have an RP4 VM appliance attached to it. And then we have uh, the target repository volume, which should be a very, very small data store that Recover Point for Virtual Machine store its configuration data uh, onto. So that's the extreme IRA. And if we go to the ES6 servers, what we can see here is that I've got uh, two ES6 servers. And as you can see, I've already formatted those two data stores. There's no point of me formatting the target VMFS data stores because those will get overwritten with the source data stores that will replicate the data from to those uh, data stores. Another thing that is important to configure is the ES6 networking itself. So we're going to need a bunch of IP addresses for each of RP4 VMs, but from an ES6 perspective, what we need to do is really configure an iSCSI VM kernel. So this is my cheat sheet, if you would like. And many of the IPs that we see here, uh, we're not going to configure them on the ESX server. Those will be configured once we deploy the appliances using the deployment manager. What we do need to configure is the VM kernel interface. So typically in the production environment, you probably want to configure at least two interfaces for the VM kernel. However, for the sake of the demo, I'm just going to configure one. So what we're going to do here is go to my ES6 servers and first of course we want to add the iSCSI adapter and of course we want to do it across the two ES6 servers that I'm going to use the Cloud Point for Virtual Machine for. It's not that RP4 VMs require iSCSI as a, as a type of uh, replication, it requires internal iSCSI as a communication link between the Recover Point appliance, the Virtual Machine appliance, to the ES6 kernel itself. So again, back to the networking, I'm going to go to networking here, configure VM kernel here, VM kernel pod group, that's the name that I'm going to give the VM kernel pod group, now we need to give it an IP address, that's the IP address, finish. And now what we're going to do is actually configure the iSCSI adapter to use this specific adapter as part of the pod group that it's going to use for iSCSI multipathing. Again, in this specific example, I'm just going to use one adapter. The reason that we don't see here is that because I actually didn't configure the adapter properly, because for iSCSI, what you actually need to do is to give it only one NIC. And by default here in this specific key servers, I've got two NICs, so that's good. We can see how not to do it. So what I'm going to do is just going to move this one to be unused and only this nick will be used. And now if we go back to the storage adapter and we'll configure it, we will see that the option is finally there. There you go. So it's going to be the interface that I'm adding for the iSCSI multipathing. Now I'm going to repeat exactly what I did on the other ES6 servers. Of course, this time with a different uh, network address. And there you go. And this interface is now configured as well. So to summarize, I've got two ES6 servers here. Each one of them has an iSCSI interface configured and bound to an iSCSI software adapter. Okay, the next part that we're going to do is actually install the splitter, the entity that will split the I.O. in the kernel of the ES6 servers. One of the things that will allow us to replicate at the VM level versus at the volume level, something that are before VMs excel in. So the first thing we need to do is actually run this command in order to allow ES6 software, the VIB file that we're going to install, to be supported. So how to do it, you're just going to patty or run SSH against the ES6 servers, in my case I've got two, and just run the command itself. So I already ran it, but in, again it's still giving me host acceptance test, and then of course we need to repeat the same command on the other ES6 server. 
So I just ran the same command on the other ES6 server, and now we are actually ready to install the VIP file. Now, though it doesn't require a restart of the ES6 server, we do recommend to put the ES6 server in a maintenance mode, which means that if it has VMs, those VMs will be motion, vMotion to the other ES6 servers in the cluster. So I'm just going to put those two ES6 servers in a maintenance mode. I do not have any running VMs at that ES6 server, so there's nothing to vMotion. So the ES6 server will enter maintenance mode uh, very, very quick. There you go. So the first thing, of course, you want to do is copy the VIP file to either a shared data store or a local data store if this ES6 server has a local uh, dr a drive that is formatted to a VMFS, which is my case in this specific scenario. So what I'm going to do now is cd to the volume, the local volume where I copied the VIP file to. And indeed, if we run an ls command, we can now see that the VIP file is there. So now what we need to do is actually install the VIP file. How do you do it? You run this command. You need to give it the full path where the VIP is. And that's about it. So it didn't do any change because it's already installed and therefore it says skip. But if it's a real installation, it will just tell you that it's now installed and it doesn't require reboot. And of course, you then need to run the exact same command on the other ES6 server where you want to run uh, the VIP file on. Uh, again, no point of doing it now because I already did it and the commands are exactly the same. The only difference that will be in that specific ES6 server is that I'm using a local drive, so the local drive on the other one will be probably SCVDI40. May not be relevant to you if you're using a shared data store, so it's the same uh, volume, which I highly recommend because then you don't need to change the syntax of the command itself. So we've got both the VIP file installed uh, on all the ESX servers, and now we are actually ready to run the Recover Point Deployment Manager. Okay, so before running Deployment Manager, we actually need to deploy the virtual RPAs on those two ESX servers. How do you deploy them? Well, those are OVA file, OVF, so we just use vCenter to deploy them, which is exactly what I'm going to do. The SX server needs to be out of maintenance mode. I'm just going to point it to the VIP file. All of these files are files that you should have when you use recover points, so they will all be packaged in a one bundle. So that's the OVA. Gonna open it. Accept all the license, give it a name. I always try to give it a meaningful name to know that this uh, OVA belongs to this specific ES6 server. This is part of the configuration itself. It's pretty much self-explanatory. It really depends uh, how many VMs you want to replicate and what's going to be the load of them. And of course, the higher the load, the more VMs that you're going to replicate, the bigger, faster, a virtual configuration you want to apply for this uh, virtual RPA. And the way to know it is, of course, do the sizing with your SEO, reading the user guide. I'm just going to give it the maximum configuration, which is eight virtual CPUs on eight and gigabyte of RAM. That's not necessarily means that you need to do it as well. And now I'm actually going to deploy this OVM to the data store that I showed you and uh, we formatted before. I'm going to use thin provisioning. There's no point of giving the OVA the full thick capacity. It doesn't actually run the I.O. inside of it, so it's going to use different data stores to do it. So I'm just going to go thin. I'm going to deploy it to these uh, specific networks. And now comes the part where I need to start feeding the IP addresses from the cheat sheet. So we're going to want to give this OVA a fixed IP address. And we can know what is it based on the IP address that I've already prepared. So if you go back, we can see that this specific ES6 server needs the following IP addresses. The temporary management IP is, is this one. However, it's important to know that the word temporary may be misleading. Temporary basically means that once the OVA will be deployed, deployment manager will need to connect to it somehow, and then you can change the IP addresses of the management IP if the specific VRPA, if that's what you wish to do. However, in my case, the temporary management IP and the long-term management IP will be absolutely the same. So I'm actually going to use the long-term IP here as well. And the rest of it is pretty much self-explanatory as well. Okay, it's now going to start and deploy this VRPA and then power it on. And I'm actually going to do the same steps on the other ESX server as well.
Okay, there you go. Right, so now that the, those two are basically deployed, it's a good time to try to ping them to see that this management interface is actually replying, which is indeed the case for both of them. And now it's actually the time to run the deployment manager itself. So again, from the folder that you probably download, you're going to run it. You're going to install recover point for virtual machines, and we're going to do the recover point installer wizard. Uh, click yes on this one. This one is an important one. It's basically a configuration file. So if you do any mistakes, uh, instead of basically replying all of these IP addresses and the settings that I'm just going to do in a second, you can save it to a file. And then if something goes wrong, you can restore from that file. And basically all the fields that you've already filled will be filled with the configuration from this read file. So I'm just going to call it target. So we know this is the file that I'm going to use if something goes wrong. And I'm going to give the target a name. So I'm just going to call it with a meaningful name that means something to me. You can, of course, uh, put whatever name that you want to. Next, any other IP addresses that uh, I've already have. So this is the cluster IP, the virtual uh, RP4 VMs cluster IP of this specific site, which again I've already prepared. So that's my cluster IP. It's basically the IP that I'm going to use later on if I want to connect to this cover point cluster. The LAN IPs are basically the management IPs that uh, I've already configured, if you recall, while I deployed the OVA, and it's going to be the same IPs in my case, so these are two, these two. The one IPs are different, those are IPs that it's going to use to communicate with the remote RPAs. So again, different IP addresses in my case. And lastly, I need to configure it, the default gateway IP. And click Next. And this is the passport for the recover point appliances. Okay, we first the first, uh, the first test to connect to these RPAs. I'm going to use IP4 for the iSCSI connectivity. And now I actually need to configure the iSCSI network address. Again, this is not the VM kernel interfaces. I'm just going to configure the netmask, followed by the actual IP addresses that I already prepared for each one of these uh, interfaces. So these are the ones that I already prepared. Again, those are the network interfaces of the iSCSI connectivity, not the VM kernel ones, which I've already configured and on the ESX servers. And that's pretty much it in terms of uh, this part of the configuration itself. Press the next button. And here it asks me to connect to the EMC in order to make sure that it's a valid uh, configuration in terms of licensing. However, because uh, we're going to ship up for VMs 4.3 as a trial and buy, you, you will actually be able to skip this part. Again, I'm using a beta version. So in order for me to skip this, I've actually got a special XML file that I'm going to use while I'm deploying it in order to pass this uh, specific compatibility uh, licensing test. That's the file. Press the next button. This part allows me to update the RPAs with the future uh, RPA uh, ISO file, which may be actually something that I will do because I'm not running the final uh, GA code. Well, for the sake of the test, I'm just going to leave it as it is. I do not have any other uh, newer version. I'm just going to do next on this one, and next on the other one. And now a uh, deployment manager actually is going to configure and connect to those RP4 VMs and configure all the IP settings that we just uh, feed into the deployment manager. Very useful software to do it instead of doing stuff via CLI. Okay, that is done. So now we're actually going to configure the authentication mode there. Again, this is actually fairly important if you want to leverage RP4 VMs in order to do one compression. You want to change it in, uh, to accessible mode, which is the less secure mode, but it's also allow you to give you the better, the best compression method over the one. Again, very useful if you've got sites with a slower link and you still want to push a lot of data between uh, those two sites. So I'm just going to leave it as accessible in this particular scenario. Here it asks me to give it the IP addresses, the virtual center, the username and the password. That may vary, of course, based on your site and if you're using SSO or not. In my case, for example, I'm using vCenter on Windows uh, server as opposed to my source site when I'm actually using the appliance site. So use the default SSO and that's pretty much it. And of course, to configure the recover point at the mid password as well. And lastly, which is a very important part and will vary between running the vCenter appliance versus the vCenter on a Windows server, is that it's looking for the certificate file itself. And the location of it, again, depends 
on which appliance you run. This is the location of uh, the certificate file. So in this specific example, I'm going to use the Windows one. So that's the path. However, in my source site, which I don't demonstrate now, right now, I'm using the virtual center appliance. So this is actually the source. And because it's a vCenter appliance in my source site, uh, by default, SSH will be disabled to the host. So you want to enable it. And it's larger than the scope of this demo, but those things are important to bear in mind. So since I'm using vCenter 6, my RUI CRT is actually this specific path. So I'm just going to point it to this one for the installation itself. And that's it. Now I'll press the next button. It's going to try to connect to the vCenter with all the information that you gave it. OK, and now it asks me which data stores should be the repository one. So I've already prepared this one, which is the 50 gig one. In real life, it can actually be small up to between 3 to 5 gig. Well, for the sake of the demo, and since we don't really count uh, zeros or thin provisioning capacity on Extreme I.O., I just created the 50 gig one, I press the next button, and it's going to store this information on. It's going to be interesting now to note what's actually going to happen in vCenter. You will see a lot of activity going on uh, between the vCenter to these VRPAs. It will attach temporary uh, repository files to them, put them at uh, suspend, resume, and things of that nature. And once that's done, the configuration will be done using Deployment Manager. Okay, so now tell me that it's going to use RP2 to format this repository volume. And since it's already formatted, RP1 will just use it. So that's okay. Just going to press the next button. And that's pretty much it. And that's it. Okay, now what we need to do is to connect those two clusters together. So I've already deployed one uh, that I showed you and another one that I've already prepared without showing you. So back to Deployment Manager. We're just going to uh, do an installer call point for virtual machines. But this time, we're not going to select installer wizard, but connect cluster wizard. So that's that option. Prepare a new cluster for connection. I'll fulfill the conditions. I give the IP address of the uh, cluster IP of the source cluster or uh, this cluster. It doesn't really matter. For the sake of the logic, I'm going to give it a source cluster IP. Fine, it's just going to connect to it anyway. And uh, next, so it's now checking connectivity to this source cluster. In the meantime, I can already prepare the, the other cluster IP, the one that I just showed you the installation for. And yeah, I want to connect this cluster to an existing cluster. So that's the one that I just installed. And next. In my case, I don't really need to add uh, additional subnets for connectivity between the cluster. However, your site topology may vary, which makes sense. So you could feed whatever you want to do here, if it makes sense to your specific scenario. Okay, we're done with that stage as well.